higher throne. We want to look at that higher throne this morning in Daniel 4. Got your Bible. Turn with me, please. Daniel chapter 4. We've already read some of it. Enough to, I think, get the idea of what this is all about. It's a unique chapter, by the way. Uh, as uh, it opens in the first three verses, Daniel 4, you realize this is a pagan king, or at least a formerly pagan king, and he is humbly offering his own autobiography. He's sending out across his empire an autobiographical document that is just a remarkable, I think, piece of humility for the most powerful tyrant of his day, King Nebuchadnezzar. We want to look at the dream and then the meaning of that dream and the fulfillment of it. That's how we want to look at chapter 4. Another dream. He had a dream in chapter 2. You remember that? Now he has another dream. God's communicating to this pagan king through dreams. Does God still do that? I don't know. Perhaps he does. He can if he wants to. But all they have to do is pick up a Bible and they'll get God's clear communication to them. But if they don't do that, maybe this is how he will communicate with them. So let's have a word of prayer and then let's look at the dream as we begin. Our Heavenly Father... We thank you that the heart of a king is in your hand. You have the ability to deal with kings, even the most powerful kings like Nebuchadnezzar was. We thank you that today we can trust you to work in the hearts and lives of world leaders. And that's why we should pray for them. Lord, we are sure that Daniel... And at least his three friends were praying for King Nebuchadnezzar and how you worked, how you humbled this king, how you changed his mind, his heart, his life. How we praise you for that. And it gives us great encouragement because you're still on the throne. You're still the God of Daniel. You're our God. And we're looking to you today and we're praying that your spirit would give us clarity and anointing and power, not only to present a message, but to hear and to receive and take it in and to get from the scripture precisely what you choose. We'll give you praise in advance for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So the dream, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has is uh, a dream that takes place in the midst of a powerful kingdom, but yet I think it has peaked. And Daniel has been able to maintain peace with all of the upheavals in this kingdom because he knew that God was sovereign. He knew that God was sovereign and that God heard the prayers of his people and that God answered prayer. And that enabled him to defy Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful tyrant in the world of his day. But it begins with Relative peace. And by the way, the first three verses are after the fact. They're after the fulfillment of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar is sending out a re uh, a re uh, statement of everything that happened to him. And so he begins like this in verse one. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations and languages that dwell on the earth, peace be unto you. So Nebuchadnezzar offers peace. He offers blessing upon all people. And I can guarantee you that that was not his normal mode. I can guarantee you that the result of his encounter with God made him a king of peace, made him a man of peace. He was not naturally. It's so interesting to me how God can take a powerful man like this a man that had that was an egomaniac and humble him and make him a man of peace. That gives me hope in our world. 
And then look at the praise that he begins with. Again, this is after the fact, after he suffered what the dream said would happen to him. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, unlike mine, <laughs> unlike man's. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. So Nebuchadnezzar's peace in verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar's praise in verses 2 and 3. It's a testimony. It's a testimony from the lips of this formerly proud king of uh, God's might and God's miracle and uh, the permanence of God's kingdom compared to human kingdoms that rise and fall. But then in verse 4, he tells us the real meat of the story. And it really is, I think, Nebuchadnezzar's perplexity. Verses 4 to 18. He took his personal, uh, he took personal responsibility uh, for the peace and prosperity that he thought that his kingdom was enjoying. He said, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest. I was at peace. I was tranquil in mine house and flourishing in my palace. But soon he learned that uh, permitted by God's will, all of this was going to change rapidly. And his life and kingdom would be completely brought into upheaval. In the first dream that he had in chapter 2, I think it's the third verse, it says that he was troubled. But this dream that he has in uh, chapter 4, he says in verse 5, I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. He wasn't just troubled, he was terrified by this dream. And so he summoned all the magi. He summoned all the wise men of his kingdom. He brought the Chaldeans, this leading class of wise men, to interpret his dream. Verses 6 and 7, I made a decree. Bring all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And I told the dream before them, Ah, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. They were baffled just like the king. They had the same perplexity. You know what this tells me? The absolute futility of human wisdom. How often we trust in our own wisdom or the wisdom of other people. And I'm not saying that uh, there is no wisdom that could help us that comes from human source. But I'm telling you, generally speaking, human wisdom is absolute emptiness, is absolute futility. And that's what this reveals. Sometimes the wisdom of man seems cool, but in the end, you end up looking like a fool. And that's what happens. They were baffled and perplexed too. But look at how this king recognizes something. Pick up in verse 8. But at last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Now notice he didn't say the spirit of the one and only holy God. He's talking about all the gods that he worshipped, all the gods that he knew of, Daniel had something special about him. He had the all the accruement of the spirit of these holy gods. There was something different that the, the king recognized about Daniel, and rightly so. Verse 9, old Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret trouble with thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. He recognizes that in Daniel, there is a remarkable superior wisdom. And it comes from 
a divine source. He had his own understanding, as I said, of divine or divinity. But we know that Daniel had the wisdom of God that he was dependent upon. And uh, it reminds me of what James says, that half-brother of Jesus who became a believer and then the leader of the, the church, the first church there in Jerusalem. James said, if you're going through a trial, you should be joyful because God's going to use it for good in your life. And he said, and if you don't understand, if you lack wisdom in the midst of that trial, then why don't you ask God to grant you wisdom in it? Because he's more than willing to give you the wisdom that you need in your trial so that you can make at least some sense out of it. So you can see some of God's purpose in it. In fact, he says in the third chapter of James something more about wisdom. He says, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? He, he says, if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. That kind of wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, central, devilish or demonic. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But, verse 17, everything turns here. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. That's the first characteristic of it, purity. And then it's peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And uh, we could say more. God's wisdom. That's what Daniel had. That's the wisdom that Daniel was drawing from, and that's what set him apart from all the other wise men in the kingdom. The pride of this king, Nebuchadnezzar, God saw it. God saw, can I call him Nebi, just for short? God saw Nebi. I don't think he'd mind that either, because at this point, he's humble. God saw Nebi's pride, and God was prepared to deal with him. God's prepared to deal with prideful hearts, no matter who it might be. God knows how to break proud, stubborn hearts, and he did so in this king's life through circumstances that he ordained, that he set up, that he permitted to happen. In fact, that he made happen. You say, you know, I've been praying for this individual. He's just so full of himself. He's so proud. I don't think anything will ever. God knows how to break those proud, stubborn hearts. If he can do that to Nebuchadnezzar, he can do it to that person that you think will never change. Don't give up praying. Well, what's the meaning of uh, this dream that he has? Because he gives Daniel uh, the dream. And then Daniel interprets the dream. We're going to pick up where we read this morning together, verse 19. And look at the meaning of the dream. Then Daniel, verse 19, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished or was astonished for one hour. And his thoughts troubled him. And the king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. That's why Daniel sits absolutely stunned for one hour and says totally nothing at all as he reflects upon the meaning of the dream, the interpretation that God gave him through God's wisdom, and he sits there stunned as he prays for wisdom to how best to reveal the bad news that is certainly designed to humble proud Nebi, his proud heart. So Daniel's troubled there in verse 19 because of the bad news contained in the meaning of the dream that brought him just to pause. And so the king sees his reticence. The king sees Daniel holding back and sees probably the, uh, the expression of his face, and he just reassures him, it's okay, tell me. Now, there must be 
not just the desire to know the interpretation of the dream on the part of the king, but also he must have had profound respect for Daniel to give him that kind of assurance that he does in that, in that uh, 19th verse. So Daniel then tells. Daniel's troubled, but now he begins to tell him the meaning of the dream. Pick up in verse 20. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, in it was meat or food for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. That's verses 20 to 22. The tree is Nebi. <laughs> The tree is the king himself. Well, what happens to that tree? Well, let's read on. Verse 23. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew or cut the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let the portion, his portion, be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over. Daniel says, King, the tree represents you, and the tree is cut down to size, and only the stump remains. In other words, King, you are going to be cut down to size but there's going to be recovery possible because the stump of your life will remain. And then he begins to interpret it in verse uh, 24. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts or the animals of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over thee till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee after thou shalt have known what the, what, uh, that the heavens do rule. You're going to live like an animal, king, for seven years. But in those seven years, you're going to learn a tremendous lesson. And the lesson that you're going to learn is a lesson that every human being needs to learn. But how much more a proud, stubborn-hearted king like Nebi? The great lesson that comes out of Daniel 4, the great lesson that Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that he's telling in a public document to everyone in his kingdom now is that God is sovereign and that I need him. That's the message, that God is still on the throne, that God is over all, that God is the one that really is in control of this universe and because of that, you and I, King Nebuchadnezzar, every human being needs God. He's on the throne. I remember uh, a preacher that uh, often would try to encourage God's people. And he would say something like, he had a whole bunch of, uh, of homey uh, southern sayings. But I remember this one particularly. He would say, cheer up. Heaven hasn't closed up shop, and the angels aren't on strike. God's still on the throne. And that's how he would uh, try to cheer up believers that were discouraged. What we learn from all of this is that God is sovereign, and he's the one that chooses human leaders. He's the one that permits whoever it is that is in charge of that nation or this nation, whatever nation it might be. They are God-appointed. In fact, in uh, the second chapter 
And I think it's uh, verse 21. Listen to this. Uh, as Daniel uh, tells the interpretation of another dream that Nebi had, he said, God changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he setteth up kings. In this fourth chapter and then the 17th verse, he says, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know. Are you in the living? You're in the land of the living, right? Okay, you got to know this. You ready for it? That the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, not just in heaven, but on the earth. He rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomever he will. And he setteth up over it the basest or the lowest of men. Yeah, verse 32. Again, he says... Uh, until Nebuchadnezzar realizes that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The psalmist says something like this, promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or from the south, but God is the judge. He setteth up one and bringeth down another. You say, well, what does that do to elections? That gives me a lot of hope. Because I know, no matter what went on, God's in charge. And he's on the throne. And it's him that sets up. It, he, has, he has a plan, folks. He has a marvelous plan, a remarkable plan. And so Daniel then begins to teach from this. Look at verse 27. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Now, this is real boldness. He's speaking to the most powerful man on the planet. He's speaking to a king that has, he's killed a lot of people in his uh, years. And here's what he says. Break off your sin. Stop your sinning. Break off thy sins by righteousness. Stop sinning and start doing right. And thine iniquities or your sin, by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility, of thy peace. Only God is sovereign, King. And men are not permitted to usurp or take credit or steal God's glory. And so God is using you as an, an instrument. God is instructing you through me to humble yourself before God, to turn to God from your sin, to show repentance, to show mercy. And if you refuse to submit, you're going to descend down to the level of an animal. Interesting. You know what's often missed in Bible prophecy? He's telling him through the interpretation of the dream what is going to happen very soon in this king's life. So he's actually prophesying to this king. You know what's often missed in prophecy? The real reason for it. And the real reason for prophecy is not simply so that you can, uh, so that you can satisfy your curiosity about what's going to happen in the future. But what Daniel is doing in verse 27 in his teaching what he's doing is he is linking prophecy with personal responsibility. And that is so important. The prophetic future has to impact the way that we currently live. If all you get from the prophetic portions of the scripture is a knowledge of what's going to happen in the future, you've missed the point. The point of prophecy is to impact the way that you live your life now for the rest of your days on this earth. And you and I will be held responsible for the truth that we know that God has given us in the scripture. And so he, he makes that prophecy very practical. He said, this is what's going to happen. And you're going to learn a, a very difficult and hard lesson as you pass through these seven years of animal-like existence. And I'm just telling you now, you can make it better on yourself if you will repent. 
If you will stop your sinning now, if you will turn to God and let him forgive your sin and let him change you, you'll be doing yourself a favor. What boldness. Yeah, this is what's going to happen in the future to you, but I'm telling you right now, break off your sin. Stop your sinning. Turn to God. He'll forgive you. He'll change you. Maybe that's a message for people here or people listening, and that is break off your sin. Stop following this teaching and that teaching and trying to get everything that you can to understand this, that, and the other, and start dealing with the practical reality of the impact of Scripture on your daily living, on your daily life. Let the Bible impact your life. Let the Bible and the Scripture and the Spirit of God behind it change you. That's the whole purpose of it. Well, in verses 28 to 37, the rest of the chapter, there's the fulfillment of that uh, interpretation of the dream. But what's so wonderful again about our God is that he gives graciously, he gives King Nebi an entire year to repent. He doesn't. God always humbles the proud. God always humbles the proud. It may not be the way in the time that we think but God always humbles the proud. In fact, there's a time yet in the future when the Bible says that the proudest of people who rejected Christ all of their life will one day bow their knee to him and confess he's God, confess that he is Lord. God always humbles the proud. And so we have uh, Nebi's uh, judgment beginning in verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, at the end of a year, he was walking in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. He was probably on the flat roof of his palace that was higher up than any other building in the entire city of Babylon. So he can look out over the entire landscape of this, this city. And he says to himself in verse 30, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom? by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? He still didn't get it, did he? He had a whole year to reflect upon that dream. And he still didn't. How much gracious time has God given us to reflect upon the message of his word that he has spoken to our heart perhaps more than once? And what have we done with it? How have we allowed God's word to impact our lives, to change our hearts, to soften our hard and proud hearts? God broke into the life of this proud king. And uh, as he's speaking, the very moment he's speaking, it says, verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. This egotistical musing is just suddenly interrupted. And God breaks into this king's life and speaks. And he brings public humility to him. Look at what he did. Verse 32. They shall drive thee from men. Thy dwelling shall be with the animals, the beasts of the field. They'll make thee to eat grass as oxen seven times shall pass over thee until thou know the most high. Rule in the kingdom of men, give it to whomsoever he will. Verse 33, the same hour the thing was fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men. He began to eat grass like a, like a cow, like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. His hair grew out so it looked like eagle's feathers and his nails, toenails, fingernails, like bird's claws. His judgment. He's inflicted with seven years of mental insanity, a rare psychosis. Uh, it happens uh, to some today. In fact, it comes, the, the, the uh, psychological word for it comes from a compound Greek word that uh, means a wolf animal. 
You've heard the myth of werewolves. This is uh, the kind of insanity. That's that's insanity, by the way. And this is insane. People don't become animals. People may think they're animals, just like just like men don't become women, and uh, and women don't become men. That's mental insanity. And this is mental insanity that this king is suffering at the moment. Lycanthropy. It's a psychosis. It's a delusional belief of you turning into an animal. And in Nebuchadnezzar's case, he was actually transformed into living like and acting like an animal. Now I know a lot of I know of a lot of leaders that act like animals. But this guy not only acted like one, he looked like one. Body transformed into looking like an animal. For seven years. Maybe Daniel and his friends and the other wise men ran the kingdom while he was out of commission. But evidently Babylon went on. Because he passed this on down to his grandson. We'll meet him next week. That's his judgment. Let's pick up in verse 34. Seven years are gone. At the end of the days, that seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. I, I gained my sanity back. And when I did, I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. It's interesting to me that in verse 34, the narrative returns to the first person. And now he's given his own witness. Humiliation has come to him and it has brought him to his senses. And I like the way he puts it. He says in verse 34, I lifted up mine eyes. That may actually be a reference to the fact that he underwent a spiritual conversion. This man, I think, personal opinion, I can't uh, be dogmatic about it. We're going to meet Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. I think he got it at the end of, I mean, what does it take for us to get it? What does it take for people to understand who God is, who we have to deal with, that what he says is true? Thankfully, it wasn't too late for him. It's not too late for you either, if you're here in the land of the living in your right mind. He was brought to his senses, and the first thing that he did, by the way, perhaps you need to come to your senses today. Perhaps what you need is to lift your eyes to God. Perhaps what you need is a spiritual conversion like Nebi. You need to be saved. You need to have your sin forgiven. You need to break off your sin by realizing, I've sinned against the, the Most High God. I need His forgiveness. I need to be put in a right relationship with Him. Oh God, I lift my eyes to you, and I ask you to forgive my sin on the basis of what Jesus did on my behalf. You acknowledge Him as your Savior. The first thing he did after lifting his eyes to the Lord is he worshiped. That's what verse 34 is about. He also, in verse 37, says, I praise and extol and honor the King of heaven. When we sang today, Be Thou My Vision, did we sing that one? High King of heaven. That's one of the, the lines. I don't know if you recognize that. It comes from this. He's the King of heaven. And I praise and extol in honor, the king of heaven is what he says. So the first thing he does is he worships. He praises. And, uh, and there, is, there is a praise and, and truth combined here. And just a, a wonderful time of worship on the part of this king. You could even say that the first three verses, again, are after he's got, got his sanity back. Those are praise as well. The first three verses of the fourth chapter. If you've been saved, you will worship. But not only that, look at what else he did. 
The first three verses, uh, verse 35, he says, all the inhabitants, maybe we should repeat this together, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the of the earth, and none can stay or say unto him, that's a witness. He worships and he witnesses. You know what? That's what Christian living is about. It's about worshiping. And when you worship, you know what happens? You get so full, you can't contain it. It overflows and you witness. Worship and witness. That's what this man does. Not only is he restored to sanity, but his great kingdom is restored. Look at verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom and mine honor and, uh, and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. But he had a right heart attitude about it now. He knew it was all from God, and it wasn't him. I didn't do it. God did it. Have you ever come, come to that realization that whatever you accomplish in life, it really has been the gracious hand of God that has enabled you to do that? That you don't have anything that you didn't receive from him originally? That everything that you have really comes from him? If you think you have intellect, he gave it to you. If you think you have skill and ability, skill sets, he gave it to you. Oh, you may have developed it, but God gave you the ability even to develop it. This is really an official statement that he makes in this fourth chapter of glorying in the Lord and warning against a proud, stubborn heart that refuses to submit to God. Can we expect this kind of thing? I mean by that, the softening and the humbling of the proud, stubborn hearts of our leaders or people that we're burdened for? Shouldn't we pray for all officials on all levels of government? Isn't that what Paul was talking about when he said, I would, first of all, that prayers be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority? that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For he would have all men to be saved and to come unto a knowledge of the truth. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, don't pray for your political leaders so that life will be nice for you. Pray for your political leaders so that the gospel can be facilitated. So that the gospel could go forth. Because it's God's will to save all men, including our political leaders, including those that are over us in authority. He wants to see all men saved. There's none of them off the chart in God's eyes. I came across an article I thought would be an interesting, wing, uh, interesting one to close with. A British uh, member of royalty, his name was Lord Reith. He was actually the founder of the British Broadcasting Corporation. He was a godly man from the highlands of Scotland. And as the BBC came of age and began to embrace much of the secularism of the United Kingdom, which of course goes back to the 60s and uh, the early 70s, it's recorded in one of the biographies that one of the young producers at the BBC in a large corporate meeting stood up and said to the general director of the BBC, Lord Reith, he said, you know, the world is changing and the nation is changing. And we really do not, sir, need this religious programming on the BBC. People are no longer interested in it. And the BBC now is beginning to establish itself and, and to show that we, we really have the nerve of the nation and the church is pretty well obsolete. Well, Lord Reif, who was a very tall man, like 6'4", apparently he stood up and he said, young man, take your seat. The church will stand at the grave of the BBC. And you know what? The church will stand at the grave of every atheist, of every country, and of every corporation 
because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it because God is on the throne and he is the one that is in ultimate control of this universe and not puny men, even some of the most powerful ones like King Nebuchadnezzar. So take heart. Take hope. Because he is still on the throne and there is a higher throne. Our Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would use our time in Daniel 4 to really stir our hearts in any and every way you see fit. If you stir us to humble us and to show us our need of you, oh, so be it. May we listen. May we not be proud and stubborn like Nebi was and have to be knocked down a few pegs. Lord, that we would just say yes to you. And then I pray that you'll use Daniel 4 just to encourage us, those of us that, you're, that are your people, to encourage us in the light of recent circumstances, whether it be the martyrdom of our brother Steve, Stephen Trell or the uh, perhaps elections that didn't go the way someone liked, whatever. Lord, you are the one that setteth up and even the basis of men because this world Although it's been usurped by a demon and is ruled over by dark rulers in the spiritual realm, spiritual wickedness in high places in the heavenlies, yet we know ultimately this is my father's world. And though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. We bank on that because that's what the Bible says. We believe it and may it impact the way that we live our lives. Pull us out of the pit, Lord. Pull us out of our pity party and our depression. And uh, may we encourage ourselves in the Lord our God as David did. We pray in Jesus' name.